Today is the 2nd of November 2010. We are at the New York State Military Museum and Veterans Research Center in Saratoga Springs. My name is Wayne Clark. Sir, for the record, would you please state your full name and your date and place of birth, please? Robert William Spence, February 13th, 1947, New York City. Did you attend school in New York City? No, I attended school in Levittown, Long Island. And uh, how far did you get through school? Did you graduate from high school? Well, I went to high school in two places. We moved to Massachusetts in 1961, Topsfield, Massachusetts, then back down Long Island. I graduated from Smithtown High School in Long Island. Um, went to community college, got drafted during the community college service. Came back from service, went into college, and finally finished my master's in health administration in 1980. When did you get drafted? Well, I got drafted, it's funny story, I got drafted twice. I was drafted in March of 1967. Mm -hmm. I essentially uh, got, I left school because I didn't like school. Mm -hmm. And got drafted as most of my friends did in 1967. The Vietnam War was getting heavy then. And I requested a deferment to get back into school. And in those days, they made one up and gave me a 1S instead of a 2S. And mm -hmm. I was safe for six months, so finally I got back into school in, in September, October I got a 1A reclassification and was drafted on December 7th, 1967 while in school full time. No. <laughs> <laughs> and I had no recourse uh, to change that, so I just went in, in the service. Mm -hmm. Where did you go for your basic training? Went to Fort Jackson, South Carolina. So you were drafted into the Yes, Army. yeah. Right. And what was basic training like for you? It's very interesting. We, the fact that we were drafted a week or a couple of weeks before Christmas was difficult, I think, for the Army because they didn't know what to do with this whole group of guys coming down. And they went through the training for three, four days, um, testing and training, and they couldn't stick us into a training unit until after Christmas. Mm -hmm. So they had us hang around in barracks and basically do nothing for a couple of days and suggested that people. Um, take school if you wanted to not go in the infantry and they tried to scare you saying you're going to go you're going to get killed you're going to Vietnam everybody mm -hmm. here so um, we all took tests <clears throat> and I took a bunch of tests with barely you know two hours sleep a day and I wound up saying okay all my friends who were drafted earlier in that year went into infantry or, or artillery so I said okay I'll take a test and I took these tests and they went into this anybody who wanted to sign up for a test for another, for another MOS, another job assignment, mm -hmm. would get it, have to do another year in the service. So I raised my hand and I said, what do you got? And I went into this hut and they said, well, you did well on this test. And they said, we would we'd like to send you to helicopter pilot training school, which is interesting because my father was a B-24 pilot in World oh. War II. And so I said, how long is that? And they said, four years ago, no. <laughs> huh. They said, what about, here's some other schools, and one was a uh, mechanic or whatever. And one was an operating room technician, which I thought was pretty safe. So I work in a hospital. I said, okay, I'll take that one. So at that point, I, I was resigned from the Army as a draftee and signed up as an enlistee. Mm -hmm. So for, I think, five days, I was a draftee. And then I resigned for another year. So I went to basic training. Uh, we went home for Christmas for about a week. Oh, they sent you home. Sent us all home. Um, I, you know, dragged us through the woods for like... A day, but stuck us on the bus, we took a train or something home. I'm not sure how we got home. But we got home for a week and mm -hmm. then came back and started basic training on, I think, the 2nd of January. Did everybody show up? <laughs> Every, mostly everybody showed up, uh -huh. which was pretty dangerous. But everybody basically showed up and we got to our unit uh, and started basic training then. We, when it was eight weeks of training. And from that, um, after that kind of training, we all were lined up like every morning, we were lined up for for assembly and for roll call at 6 o'clock in the morning, 5.30. And they, at that day, it was the last week of training, the last day, and they gave out everybody their assignments and basic training. You're going to this school, you're going to this. And I'd say half of them went to infantry, some went to artillery, and then, as we knew in the Army, they could do anything they want, regardless of what they signed and you signed. But they gave me my school, so they mm -hmm. said, you're going, I was going to medic school first, I went 10 weeks to Fort Sam Houston to medic school. What was that like for you? That was that was good. That mm -hmm. was it was I think March 
in the March, I believe. Was it as tough as uh, basic training physically? No, or? no not th th well, there was some physical training every day, mm -hmm. but basic training was more uh, regimented and more structured than this medic school. Medic school was very structured. Just so you had a company, you had a march, you had to do PT every day. Um, but it was an interesting type of environment because it was, it was, we went from the cold to the hot and we saw a lot of um, stuff that would, no, nobody thought there would be a medic, but a lot of guys in my medic class were draftees. Uh, and I was going to another school after that I on see. the same base. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and a few guys in my class were actually going to the OR tech school with me that was right half a mile down the road to another barracks. But medic school training was terrific because we learned a lot of stuff. Um, had PT every day, we had mess hall duty, we had the same kind of stuff. They always kept you busy. Um, but it was nice weather down there. We really didn't get to call much, just like basic training. You never get to call anybody. You did it once in eight mm -hmm. weeks. Uh, and in AIT, which is Advanced Individual Training, we, I think we got called, we were able to call once a week. Mm -hmm. and the, you know, on, on did you have weekends off at all? Yeah, we did. We did have weekends and we had nights kind of after chow and after our duties, which were, a lot of guys had mess hall, which mm -hmm. you wound up spending more time in the kitchen after that. So, But <clears throat> that was okay. Um, one of the interesting things about that is we had a march to class. And when we marched, um, they said, did anybody play the trumpet or drums? I said, I played the drums, and I, I just made that up, but I, I had good rhythm, so I played the drums. And we wound up marching to class and marching back, and I was in the front with the drums. When everybody went to PT, I took the drums back to the back and went to sleep. So I didn't, <laughs> so I didn't have to do PT in the hot sun in the, in the big macadam where everybody did this. Uh -huh. Where, and then they finally got used to that. But anyway, after the, we graduated from medic school, most of the guys, I'd say, 70% of my class, and there was probably, I don't know, 70 guys in my class. Um, a few of them went right to Vietnam, but most of them went to Hawaii. And they were all so happy, but little did they know that at that time, I think that was April of 68, the AmeriCal division was forming, or one of the divisions was forming over there, and they're sending all these medical personnel for different companies over there. And from Hawaii, they went right to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So, and then I went, to uh, OR Tech School, Operating Technician School, which was another 12 weeks. It was 12 seven. weeks. Yeah. And um, actually, it was, it was 10 weeks there and then two weeks of AI um, on the job training. Mm -hmm. So I went to, uh, and it was right in the summer, Fort St. Louis was very hot. We had a little bit more freedom at that school, but it was still the same. We still had to march to class. We still had to um, actually do more things. We had to learn actually to be in the operating room. We were experienced the operating room. Uh, and the irony of that job for me is when I was a kid, I had three or four surgeries and I hated the opera. I hated the smell of ether and in those days, in the early 50s, we had ether and I had a tonsillitis, appendectomy, a hernia. And I didn't know why I chose the school, but I chose the school. But after that, a real good friend of mine who was from Long Island as well was a policeman. And near the end of the OR tech school, he had been through medic school, and he only wanted to do was be an MP, but in the Army, its infinite wisdom made him a, mm -hmm. a medical person. He quit, he quit the OR school with two weeks left and, and just took off, and he wound up being in, with an infantry division in Vietnam in, in 1969 or 70. But anyway, graduated from there, and when they gave us our assignments, they said this was the on-the-job training, you're going to go for t at least two to four weeks more and work with somebody in a, in a hospital base somewhere in, in our system. And I wound up going to Fort Stewart, Georgia. The only person who went to Fort Stewart, which was, in those days, it was nothing. It was an old World War II compound. Uh, all the floors were wood, the walkways were wood, and it was in the middle of, uh, it was east of, west of Savannah, in the middle of some, near the Oki Pinoki Swamp. It was hot as hell. So I wound up spending almost four months there, three or four months, because I, didn't get any orders. So I wound up just being an OR tech and learning all the civilian type of surgery. Were you kept busy? Kept pretty busy. It was very slow <laughs> work. The operating room was busy. There was lots of dependent surgery there, like females, and there was local surgery of some of the GIs and soldiers. Uh, I think today that, that, that army base is a huge 3rd Infantry mm -hmm. Division base. And they also had helicopter training there because it was, it was like, it looked like Vietnam, it was jungly, it was all mm -hmm. a swamp. So 
they had a lot of training there. So I, I spent three or four months there, and finally... Now let, let me just go back a little bit. What actually did you do in the, the operating room? Did you hand the doctor's instruments? Yeah, we, we, first of all, we had to observe. Mm -hmm. And then they told us to... Uh, we had to, like... My job was to hand the doctor. We had to learn the instruments, learn how to be sterile, learn how to where you are in the environment, learn the operating room, learn what the anesthesiologist does, learn what the surgeon does, learn what the first assistant does, and be their eyes and ears when he opens his hand like this. You're supposed to know what he wants because you're looking where he's going. He opens up the cavity, the abdomen, he wants the spreader, he wants going through the ribs, he wants the cutter. So we have to know instruments, and there were several different types of instrument trays you had to learn. There was a general instrument tray that was big, a minor one, there's an orthopedic one, there's a neuro one, there's an ophthalmology. We had to learn all these instruments, learn how to package them, sterilize them, and take them out and line them up and get them ready on this, what they call a tray, which is you hung over the patient's feet after they were draped with sterile, uh, sterile towels. And then you would get it all set up. You'd thread the needles, you get the needles ready, and you'd have everything ready, just basically an assistant to the surgeon. So that was pretty interesting. The, the only part that I didn't like is they made you, with these young GIs who had either hernias or hemorrhoids, you had to go shave them in those nether regions. <laughs> and I wound up saying, you do it yourself because I didn't want to do it. <laughs> and that there was a master sergeant who was in charge of the operating room. He was a real southern boy. He said, you going to do this? And he showed me how to do this on this, this poor guy. I got so basically, I just I, I said, no, you, you can. I, I, I was, that was my night duty. I would go around to the wards and say, tomorrow morning you're having hernia surgery, you have to be shaved and all this. And after a while, I just gave it to them. I said, you, you do the best you can. <laughs> so let them do it. Because they wanted everybody shaved. But then soon after that, a year or so later, the, the Army decided that it wasn't that necessary because you, you wound up getting cuts, which weren't good before surgery. They didn't want that. So, so anyway, but that was part, part of the job. And the town, there was really nothing to do there. There was one bar. And, um, went to Savannah once or twice, but I wound up spending at least a month doing nothing because I was on a, uh, what they call a hold, waiting for an order. And um, I think it was around October, November, and finally I got orders for Germany. And uh, I left for Germany in the middle of November, I believe, mm -hmm. and didn't know where I was going until I got there. I got to, I think it was Frankfurt, wherever their, their main depot was, and they sent me to a place called Wurzburg Hospital, which was a pretty big hospital. And as soon as I got there, I met my friend who I told you about who went to the MPs, and mm -hmm. he wound up being a medic at this hospital in Wurzburg. And I hung out with him for a while. I only spent um, maybe a month and a half there. And I worked basically in the operating room. And, then, and the Army said, you're going to go to another place, which is a place called Lonstuhl, which today is a gigantic hospital for the returnees from Iraq and Afghanistan. It, it was a, like a six-story hospital. It was right on the French-German border. So I spent four months there, a total of six months in Germany, and then I got orders for Vietnam. And, and I didn't realize, but at the time, the Army had a, a policy that said you have to spend, six, if you go to Germany, you can't send to Vietnam unless you spend, spend at least six months there. So the guys who were in my operating room tech school who went to Germany, they had the exact same thing happen to them, about four or five of them. They went to Germany for six months, and they all, they all got shipped to Vietnam. Now, how much time did you have in the service at that point? I had about a year and a half, because I went in December 67, and this was when I, I went to Germany in November of 68, so that was almost a year. Mm -hmm. And then when I finally left Germany in April of 69, that was like a year and a half, maybe, a year and five months. So they gave me orders. I think uh, I had taken my first leave in Germany. I went to Amsterdam on a train, which was great. It was wonderful. As soon as I got back, they said, Spence, report to the orderly room. You got orders from Nam. I go, oh, this so was my first take back from my vacation. Uh -huh. So I got my orders, and my orders were to report to Fort Lewis, Washington, sometime in May or June. And the good thing about that was I had 45 days leave because they gave you two weeks travel time from Germany to Asia. So I got home, I think I got home May 1st or 2nd, spent the whole month of May at home, and which was wonderful because it was warm weather and summer and all that. And um, Finally left before 
Lewis, Washington. And I came from a big family. I have seven kids. I have four brothers and two sisters. And I was the first one in the service. And uh, my brother was in the service at the same time. He was in Fort Gordon. And he heard I was going to Vietnam. He went AWOL to come home to see me leave. And he lost his lost pay and all that. But uh, it was probably one of the most emotional scenes I've ever had in my life was at the airport at LaGuardia, leaving to go with my mm -hmm. uniform. And my mother was there, my best friend, my brother, some girlfriend, I don't remember, and my father. And I was, my mother couldn't even talk. She was like speechless and, and I got on a, you know, I couldn't talk either. I got on the plane and I sit down, still very emotional. And this guy sits down next to me. And he says, huh, going to numb, huh? And I said, yeah, he goes, too fucking bad. Excuse my language. But I, I, I got up and left. I, I was gonna really clock the guy. So I just got up and walked away. I went to the back of the, of the plane. Because the guy was a real mm -hmm. idiot. So I just sat back there. I finally got to Fort Lewis, Washington. And because I was in an MOS, a military occupational status that was not infantry, they had to give you infantry training again. And it was two weeks of that. We had to go through rifle centering. We had to go through I don't know, a lot of stuff about Vietnam and what you can learn over there. We had to watch films on, on the special forces and all those things. But we were all support troops. And some of my friends who went to OR tech school and medic school were there with me. So we, was two or three guys that were together, which was fortunate because I, I got, got to know somebody. So we spent two weeks there and they said, okay, now you're going to Vietnam. I'm getting a plane and it takes to Alaska first. Mm -hmm which was gorgeous. Then we took us to Hawaii, to probably the most beautiful states in the country before we go to Asia. They went to Hawaii. We, went, we probably stayed two or three hours in each place. And finally, after Vietnam, we got to Vietnam, it was, I say, one o'clock in the morning. And the pilot says, the steward says, if you look out your window, you can see the coast of Vietnam. We're gonna be landing in uh, Cameron Bay, which was, you couldn't see anything. There were some lights. We landed, I think it was one or two o'clock in the morning, Cameron Bay. And it, the thing I remember landing, it, it was so hot and muggy. It was the hottest place I've ever been in. Reminds me of Florida, way down in Florida. It was just instant heat. And they took us to our barracks and said, go sleep. But before they said sleep, they said, you, 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 and you, you're going to go to work, KP. So, so you know, typical. And I said to me, you're gonna, in the morning, you're gonna do what they call shit can duty because they had outhouses that were, um, they're pretty big structures that had like four different things. They had half, took these gigantic oil cans, cut them in half and used them as the receptors. And you had to pull them out, put some fluid on it, light it up. Fortunately, there, there were Vietnamese workers who helped you do that because I didn't know to pull it. So I just, we did the lighting. So basically I did that for two days. Mm -hmm. and other guys got orders, and I didn't get any orders, and finally they said, my friend got his orders the first day, and he went up to Nha Trang, which is on the coast, which was a big special forces hospital. So they sent me to um, Binh Long, which was near Saigon, where the major depot was for administration and relocation and assignment. So I went to there, and the next day I had to walk on these duck boards to this administrative office and I sat down and this guy says well, to me, where do you want to go? It's the first time in the army somebody said, where do you want to go? And I said, I want to go to 73rd of back up and play coup because that my friend who was the military guy was up there. He said, come on up here. And the guy says to me, well, we just sent our last OR tech up there. I'm going to send you down to the 29th of back, way down in the Mekong Delta. It's pretty new, it's a nice place. I go, okay. And it was very fortunate for me because the 73rd of Act, that Thanksgiving, was attacked by sappers. They killed two nurses, a doctor, and a couple of patients. They went through the wire and mm -hmm. shot everybody. And my friend was, wound up being shot down. He was a medevac chopper, uh, uh, a medic and a chopper. He wound up getting shot down and lost for 10 days. But it was a nightmare place, so I, I didn't go there. Mm -hmm. I think somebody was telling me, I had an angel send me down to a better place. So I, I got on this big, gigantic C-40 plane, me and nobody else, flew down to the Delta, got to the 29th of back, <clears throat> and it was pretty quiet. <clears throat> I got picked up by the first sergeant, which was unusual. And he's a really easygoing guy, chomping a cigar at 6 o'clock in the morning. 
talking about this is a fairly new place. We got we got real toilets here. Some most of the time they work. So we got real showers. Sometimes they're hot, mostly cold. You know. And it was basically what they called hooches, which were all made of wood and screens mm -hmm. and some fans. So I got there, settled in, and within two days, so another guy shows up. We became instant buddies and wound up instantly working in the OR. They didn't give me any chance to, to really, they expected you to, to do what you had to do. And our job mainly was, we did what they call secondary closures of wounds from the 9th Infantry Division, which was across the river. And those guys would get shot, and when they get shot in the field or hit, they really wouldn't, they, they'd fix what happened inside. Like one guy got shot in the body. they fixed the bone, but they wouldn't close the wound totally because they were worried about infection. So they left it open for a week, and they'd come to us for secondary closures, and we did the wire closures and all that. So, and we, so you actually stitched? Yeah, we stitched them up, but they stitched them up with wire most of the time because uh, they had to really debride the wound, which means make it bloodier so it can heal better. And we also got, in between that, that was our regularly scheduled surgery. We had a scheduled surgery for things. Then we also had trauma come in any time. Our hospital was half Special Forces um, and half Vietnamese, and the other half U.S. Army or U.S. Air Force or Navy. We had uh, right next door with the what they call the groundwater Navy, the PT boats, the real small ones. And then we had the uh, Air Force on the other side. We had engineers and we also had um, uh, special forces. Special forces guys mostly kept to themselves and stayed in, stayed in the woods. They stayed in the jungle all the time. And they stayed in these little tiny villages that were up river. We were only like, I would say, 40 miles from Cambodia. So they would go up river and stay in these little places that were always dangerous places. And they would come in every once in a while with their Vietnamese counterparts and we would have to take care of them. So those guys, <clears throat> I think, lived in the barracks, but I'm not sure. And one of them was a doctor. He was a captain. And he wound up going out there. I, mean, I don't know why he was a, a, a captain and a doctor. I mean, I know why he was, was a captain, but why would a doctor be active? But he wanted to be there. And he had support troops and all that stuff. And we'd occasionally get, uh, I shouldn't say occasionally, but a lot of times we get Vietnamese army and army who would be, at that time, this was June of 69. I think Nixon announced the Vietnamization program that month. And they started churning that before it actually happened. And the 9th Division, who was the infantry division that we supported, were the first ones to leave. And they left in September, October. So before that, we were taking care of them. And then they started to leave. And they, we consolidated forces once some guys had time left and all that stuff. So, um, But basically, that was it. We had trauma. We had scheduled surgery, and I spent most of my, spent my time in the operating room, and then I, uh, the worst part was the, the traumatic stuff, the guys losing their legs and things like that, and um, the difficult part was seeing guys who you thought would survive or didn't, because mm -hmm. they knew their trauma, and the medics in the field and the, and the, and the field hospitals would do a very good job of disguising what kind of trauma they had. If a guy's leg was basically blown away or shot up, they didn't know it because they wouldn't let him see it or they gave him a lot of morphine, morphine. morphine surrettes and he was hedged out of it. But, um, I remember one story is a guy who we were, we were, we came in, blow, I think both his legs were, were blown, shattered, but they weren't, they were still attached. And he was kind of delirious and he came in and we, they go for the ER, to the x-ray, right to us. It was boom, boom, boom. And he was on a stretcher, and we'd taken him across to the operating room table. And he said he was going to see his wife the next month in Hawaii. He was going on R&R. &R. And the blanket, the sheet got pulled away, and he saw his leg, and he went, oh, my God. And he went to shock, mm -hmm. and he died. And, he, and because he's, when they go into shock, there's really not much you can do. And, he, and everybody was there to try to help the guy, but he died. But the irony of all, all the stuff is there's... I mean, I started writing memoirs about the things that they did it was so long ago, I can't remember half this stuff. But, um, and one of the other parts of our hospital was called Graves Registration, where they take the uniform for guys who died and their effects and all that. And that was, that was kind of a gory section that nobody wanted to go into. Mm -hmm. But um, 
We also had helicopter pilots who were attached to us, and they would, um, they were called loach, because low observation, real tiny things. Mm -hmm. And we had nurses in our compound, and some of those, they had romantic liaisons with these chopper pilots and the doctors, and it was real, it was a real trip, the whole place. I remember one guy who was a chopper pilot got shot down, and the nurse who was in the ER had him come in, and he was basically dead. I mean, all these, these weird stories about stuff. But, um, and then finally, I think it was in December, see, I got there in June, in December of 69, they transferred me to a dispensary in the middle of Canto, which was kind of a city away from the hospital. It was about six miles away. Uh, I guess I was kind of a problem child. I, was, I didn't really care what was going on. We were all, you know, half of us were smoking dope and half drunk. So, <laughs> so they, they sent me down to this dispensary where there were, you were basically it was a little tiny house in the city. And there was a, an infantry guy there who was security, plus an old Papa son who had an M1 from World War II, World War I. And another guy who was like an E5 above me, and then me, I was the only medical person. There was four people sleeping in this place. Now what rank were you? I was E4, which was spec four. That's, mm -hmm. the, that's the highest rank I achieved. So I guess they sent me down because they needed a medical person. And we took, it was like a, it wasn't operating clinic, it was basically a clinic for MPs that came in who had gonorrhea, it was for anybody who had an accident, they'd come in there, any Vietnamese civilians that had fell or whatever, or somebody's wife was pregnant, anything came in there. And we wound up basically sometimes just giving, um, guys were going on leave in r and make sure their, their shots were up to date, we do that. And at nighttime, we were all by ourselves. And there was barbed wire around the place, but there was nothing you could do if they came in. Now, what about your chow on that? We, I don't, I don't remember. Did we, you have to travel back to the base? No, I think meals? we made our own. I think okay. the, the guy who was an E5, I think he was in charge of that. He, he used to go because it was a big air base near that city. And he would be, somehow he was with the, he got the chow there. I don't know how we got the chow. But a lot of times we had Vietnamese food. We had a lot of soup and noodles and fish and all that. We had a lot of local food because Papa San and his wife would bring us food. And across the street from us was a province chief who was a big guy in the, in the province. And his house was totally guarded. And, and I remember at Christmas time, we built a snowman out of chicken wire and sheets. And I remember him, the only time I saw the guy, oh, he came across with his daughter to show us the American snowman. And we had the fake Christmas tree there with the lights and all that kind of stuff. But it was a popular place because anybody could come in at any time. And one night, and right, this is right on what they call the Basak River, which is a tributary of the Mekong Delta. And across the river was what they call the Hot Island, because the VC were always there. And they, every night they would shell an island. And once in a while, I think they would go, they, either the Navy or, I think it was the Navy, because the Navy patrolled that area. And one night we had a guy come in, I know, and I know he was VC. He was all shut up, and they had no place to take him. So I, all, all I wanted to do was send him to the hospital. No, no, we didn't want to go to the hospital. We to. So we basically, they came in with the AK on, and we basically did your basic uh, compression and wrapping and all that kind of stuff and sent him on his way. They didn't want to go to the hospital, so. And the other benefit I had when I was there was I, I got an ambulance. I was the ambulance driver, so I could just go anywhere, drive my ambulance, put the siren on. And the, the city of Canto was a big place for all servicemen to go to bars, to girls, and all that kind of stuff, prostitutes and everything. And I remember one time that the VC would use little children to, to do nasty things. We had an MP station in Canto, and a little kid had a Ritz cracker can, was bringing it to the MP station, he got to the front door, and it exploded, he, he was dead. There was, he was trying to blow up the, because he didn't know what was in it, mm -hmm. some guy gave him some, some money. So those are, kind of, those are the kind of civilian things that happened, and one night there was a uh, the Vietnamese army, and they had rivalries too, it was like the Arban Airborne and Marines. They had a shootout in the parking lot, and we had to go get these guys from both. It was like a gunfight. So <clears throat> these guys were shot, and got one guy, one guy was dead, the other one we had to bring back, and we, uh, we, we 
sent him up on an ambulance to the hospital and all that kind of stuff, and he survived. But it was, it's, it's like a wild, wild place. But now you, you mentioned uh, um, in your paperwork uh, operating on a, a BC woman that, that came in. Yeah, that was towards the end of my tour. I remember um, it was around the time Cambodia was invaded, but she, uh, I was on call, and we used to have to sleep in the operating room because you, you were, weren't allowed to sleep in your hooch because you had it, because the ER was right next door and you'd hear everything. And the ER tech would come in and say, get up, we've got somebody coming in. So we had this woman come in, it's probably like five o'clock in the morning, and she's covered with mud usually. You know, people come at night, they're all dirty, covered with mud. And a uh, young lady, and she was gut shot, and she's on a stretcher. They said there's no broken bones, but she's shot here. And what happens is they, she was running at nighttime. Yes, they're not supposed to be out because there's a curfew. And she, they found her on the river running, I guess running guns on a sampan across from one island to the next, and they shot out the sampan. And then we pick up the survivors and bring her back. We did brought her back, brought her back to us. And she um, couldn't speak English, of course, looked, looked very angry. So we, and we took her down from the ER stretcher to the OR table and opened up her gut, and she, she really realized that she was pregnant. And the baby was dead. And the eyes, I'll never forget her eyes because her eyes were like fear and anger at the same time looking at me as I was trying to put her cross on the table and start to scrub up her, her abdomen. And she didn't know anything. We had Vietnamese people helping us interpret, telling us. But the, they we shot the baby. She was probably like three months pregnant or something. Took mm -hmm. that out and fixed her up. And who knows what happened to her. But that was towards the end of my, end of my tour. But another thing during. Cambodia, which was, I think, it's funny how the, the papers announced it, I think, May or whatever, but we were in there a month before. As I remember going in the ER, I was in the ER, and I'm looking at, you always look in the ER to see what, what's going to happen, see what you're going to get, and this, I see this Vietnamese looking soldier, but he's black, and that's Cambodia, they're very, very dark, and, uh, and I looked at his toe tag and I said, Cambodian Army. I said, what are we doing with the Cambodian Army here? And when they started to get these Cambodian, because we were already in there. Special Forces were in there, mm -hmm. the Lerps were in there, all these, all these long-range reconnaissance guys were in there. Because the BC and North Vietnamese had compiled a huge cache of weapons all along the border, because we weren't allowed to go in there. They were. So, i never forget, it was April Fool's Day, 1970, I was on call. And at 5 o'clock in the morning, we get a call, we got mass casualties coming in, and it was the worst day over there. Because that's when it really blew up, mm -hmm. and we went, it must have been, I'd say almost two days straight, with people coming in, coming in, coming in, coming in, coming in. And they're mostly, there are guys, a lot of Vietnamese guys, they're all shot, and they went boom, 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 boom. And we had, we took a break. And they kept coming, and they just kept coming, because we were the closest hospital to that part of Cambodia. Mm -hmm. There was, I think, another one up by what they call the Parrot's Peak, about the 25th Infantry Division, then ours. And we, they split them all up, and there was, there was lots of them. And that was, that was a very busy. And then um, the consequence of that, we had a, a, probably shouldn't tell the story, we had a doctor over there who was a little nutty. And I, I, actually, I knew him when I got back to the States, because he was from Long Island. And he was a general surgeon, and he he liked to do you know speed drugs to so like stay awake and, and work on the patients, right? And I'm on call, and he comes one night. This is after this mass casualty thing, maybe a week or two later. He he was making rounds at three o'clock in the morning, and he had he had done surgery on a guy Vietnamese who was shot in the chest, and he had to put the chest tube in, open him up you know, sewed up what he could sew up and sent him back to the ward. But the guy kept bleeding out. His, his chest tube, the bottle, kept filling up with blood. He didn't know what it was. So finally, he comes through the operating room to us, which were, you know, with these, these push-open doors, blasting through. And he goes, oh, we got to open this guy up. we got to open him up. All right, okay. So I call the others in, anesthesiologist in. And this guy's, like, ready to scrub up and all this stuff. And he opens him up from here all the way back here. And the guy's bleeding, bleeding. doesn't know where it's coming from. We worked probably three hours on this guy. I must have used, I think I was circulating, which means I wasn't initially operating. I think I initially operated and somebody else came in to give me a break because I was on call all night. And we wound up, we had bottles of saline, in those days it was glass, 
and we wound up saline in blood. I kept pouring saline into the cavity so he could see. And saline in blood, saline for three hours, and we wound up having, there was probably an inch of blood and water all over the floor because it kept seeping off the, and this guy, and when you're an operator, the surgeon's in charge, he decides. We all knew he was kind of wacky. So he just kept trying to find this bleeder, trying to find it, and it, this bleeder was way in this guy's back, went through his lung, hit an artery in the spine. He couldn't see it through the lungs. So he kept bleeding and bleeding and bleeding. So finally, he, and he keeps trying to shock the guy with the, with the, with the you know, plates, shock him, shock him. I'm going, we got water on the floor here. And the anesthesiologist finally says, he says, he says, uh, Stan, he's dead. No, he's not. No, he kept trying and trying and trying. And it was a very surreal mm -hmm. scene because we all stepped away and he's still trying to dig in there. And the guy, the guy's dead. You mm -hmm. can't do anything. So it took everybody a while just to walk away from him and let him keep doing this stuff. And the anesthesiologist finally said, hey, cut it out. Stop, stop, stop. So he was just another guy. I mean, he was interesting, but it was interesting how surgery operated. It was run by nine commissioned officers and a, an older female officer who was the head nurse. She was the tough one, and the NCO was the guy who made us do everything. So, But it was a tight-knit group. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of fun. Um, we had the Vietnamese do the tough things, like taking the legs to the incinerator and the arms and burn the stuff. We didn't. We did that in the beginning, but then we hired Vietnamese to do it. But it was an interesting place. Mm -hmm. And um, I spent 13 months there because when I was getting towards the end of my tour, the Army had a... Um, a rule that said if you have less than five months left in the army and you're in a war zone, you can get out. Mm -hmm. So I extended one more month and got out of the army in two years and seven months. So it really was beneficial to me. So, and uh, my friend who was in the 73rd and got shot down when I got home, he was just messed up. He got lost and had shrapnel wounds all over his arms. And I don't know what happened to him, but I know he got in a major car accident when he got back and hurt himself. Hmm. But, but now, now, whereabouts were you discharged from when you got back? That's another interesting thing. We left. We had to go to Long Bin to get discharged from the Army, where they put us all in a room and said, open up all your stuff. You're not taking anything out of here that shows the Army, gives the Army a bad name. And I had really a lot of pictures of operating room and stuff. So everybody's scared. They want to go home. And they didn't check anything. <laughs> He just said, okay, close it up. So I said, and I, I wound up giving up all these pictures. Huh. That would, you know, so. But anyway, we, we got on a plane, and instead of going to the west coast of the United States, we went to Fort McGuire Air Force Base in New Jersey. 24 hour plane ride. I think we stopped in Washington State, and then went all the way to New Jersey. And we got to McGuire, probably in the morning, I think. Got onto the bus, get to the base, and they gave us a couple of hours to clean up and do what you want to do and go to one more meeting. You want to sign up? You can do this and do that. But yeah, screw you, man. And they let you out. And finally, I took a, I think I took a, a limo or a taxi to John F. Kennedy Airport, where my uncle met me. And my mother and father were at his house, which was this was in Queens. Mm -hmm. And it took me there, and it's, that was the end. Then I, when I got home, it was a strange thing. Being, you, you know, you've gone 13 months, it feels like you've gone forever. Your whole life has changed. Your whole perception of where you were and who you were changed. And uh, I wound up leaving. When I got home, I was only home for two months. I, I went, I, I left. My mother said, I think you better leave, because I was, I don't know, I was doing some stupid things there. And I wound up meeting a friend of mine who was also over there. I was driving on a road next to the university. And he said, why don't you come with us? We've got five guys, we're in a house. And that's how I started. Was kind of, I just, I really never was home. So and then my brother, who was in Germany, got out six months later. And I went to pick him up. So mm -hmm. it was an interesting thing. I mean, we had a lot of, one of the things about uh, medevac pilots, medevac, medevac medics, and our, our, next to our hooch were these guys who were, they went out with the choppers to pick up the wounded. And they would always go, they wound up in the jungle, and they wound up taking back these, these strange animals, monkeys, birds. And uh, 
they had this one monkey and they chained him up to a, to a, uh, a bunker. And they, and they had a dog and they wound up having boxing matches half the time. And of course the monkey always won because he was faster. And then they had a, a chained up uh, hawk or something. I don't know. They wound up doing all these weird things. And, but those guys were, were quick. They wanted stuff right away. They'd be calls right away. And, you know, and thankfully my area was relatively passive just before I got there. Mm -hmm. Except for the special forces in, in Cambodia. And it was pretty mild. We had, we had trauma and casualties all the time, but it wasn't, except for the Cambodia thing, that was really, that was pretty bad, you know. And the special forces guys were always getting screwed up and getting hit, so. Uh, and most of these things, these things happened at night. It was mm -hmm. always at night time. I remember one time we had a North Vietnamese captain who was captured. And he looked like a kid. They said he was a captain. He had a shot in the chest. And he had a chest wound, had a chest bottle hanging. And he recovered a day. Then the next day, they found him on the barbed wire dead. He tried to get out. I guess he was so indoctrinated that hmm. he was probably the best place he could have been in. Yeah. But he, he got out of the, the ward at night and tried to go over the wire, and they found him on the wire. So it was the stupid stories about it. The indoctrination, all that kind of stuff. But they were tough. They were really tough. I mean, you know. And uh, the Navy guys were even worse because when we had Vietnamese Vietnamization program, they wound up taking those little boats out with the VC with, with the the Army Navy, and that was a transition period. But things happened then too. But mm -hmm. I mean, there were a lot of I could tell you a million stories. But basically, it was an interesting job. Uh, I'm glad I went there. I wasn't glad at the time. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, how do you think your time in the service changed or affected your life? It, it gave me perspective on a lot of things, but not initially. Maybe now it gives me. I am still in touch with four or five veteran friends, and every year we have a, a reunion. We just went to Vegas last year, probably going to go again this year. Um, one, one of my buddies became a doctor. Another one is still doing operating room stuff in Florida. He's still doing it. Mm -hmm. But he does more than just, he actually, in, in Florida, he can do more. He does more surgery. He does uh, stitching and stuff. And a couple other guys, one was a teacher, and another guy was a psychologist, and we still get together. And we still talk about the old stuff, and mm -hmm. who did what, and half the stuff, we don't, rem I don't remember half the stuff that went on, but, you know, it was, um, it was really, puts, puts some perspective on your life. And people who are not there think different things about you. You know, what did you do? Who did you kill? Who did this? I said, I didn't kill anybody. I was into the, the healing thing. And then when I got back, a friend of mine, the guy I lived with after I got back, he was a Marine, went over because he got in a fight with his father. His father called him a wimp or, you know, another nasty word. And he joined up. And he, he had malaria twice. And every year, flu time, he got sick and he lost weight and he still had it in him. And this guy was on a patrol once. And he was kind of a heavy set guy. He was carrying a what they call a law, a law light anti tank weapon. And they were going through a jungle trail, and the thing was slipping on his shoulder. So he bent down to pick it up, and right then a 50 caliber machine gun opened up and killed six guys in his squad. And he was the only one that was alive, and there was another squad up there. And just because he, he bent down, <laughs> he stayed alive. Mm -hmm. And he told me, we used to commiserate. He said, I, he said, I could never do what you did. You did the worst. I said, I didn't do anything. I said, you did the worst. He says, no, you did the worst. You, you had to take these guys in. So everybody's perspective on what they did was different. Mm -hmm. And being an operating tech was okay. And I never really, never really had any recurring, I did have one recurring dream, but it was basically that, that scene I tell you with a, the gigantic blood everywhere and his walking mm -hmm. around. But in the dream, the guy at the table was like 10 feet high. But I, one, one time I went to the Vietnam Memorial by myself, I think it was probably 2005, and it was a winter day. Went there all by myself, and I came around the back way, and it, there's a statue there of nurses holding this guy and looking up, and they're looking up at the chopper. And I came around the corner, and someone had put roses on the statue, and it landed right on the soldier's heart, and it looked like blood, and it gave me a real flashback. And then I went to the wall, and there was nobody there. But it was just an interesting perception of what you know, the wall is just a strange thing. Mm -hmm. It's just an amazing thing. But, uh, 
I don't know. It's uh, it gave me a perspective on life that's different. I guess you don't know until you're older. Until you, well, it's like my father. I did a did a retrospective on him this year. I did a 85 page interview with him uh -huh. uh, on his on his his uh, pilot experience in World War Two. Now, did you join any veterans organizations like the VFW or? I did Legion? for a while. I had a friend of mine who was also I worked in the Department of Corrections for 28 years. And was a nurse who worked in Elmira, who was a Marine, a Navy medic with the Marines. He got me into VFW in Elmira mm -hmm. for a couple of years, and then I just never re-upped with it. So, but I, I was going to go to the convention last year, but I just I never really joined that. Mm -hmm. um, I always thought those were guys who just go to the place and drink beer and tell stories and stuff like that. So I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'd rather do it with, with some other folks. But I never really joined any organization. When I first got out, I joined. Vietnam Veterans Against the War, which is a typical, you know, in those days everybody is, you know, has a different mindset, you know. And I went to a march on D.C. with Nixon in 74, 73, and all that stuff, and it was a big party time. But nowadays I think it's stupid. I mean, it's, it doesn't make sense now, you know, mm -hmm. because people don't know. People who do that have never been there, mm -hmm. you know, so. And it's just, it's, it's, it's a sobering thing when you're faced with that kind of stuff, but I mean, seeing dead bodies and seeing burnt bodies and seeing that kind of stuff is interesting. It's not interesting. It's, you don't really get traumatized by it because it's a job. The job is to do this. Okay, this comes in, boom. You focus on, you have a laser focus on the item, not the person. Mm -hmm. They're not patients. They're as I tell you, one more, one more story just before I left. There was a uh, EM, cl EM club at the air base in Canton, and they had a perimeter. And one guy was on the night perimeter the night before, and he brings in a hand grenade he found, brings it to the EM club. The guys are sitting around the table drinking beer. He drops the hand grenade, somehow drops it under the table. It blows up underneath the table. These guys are sitting there, and one guy gets hit right in the testicles. And he was going home in two days. He lost one testicle. And it's, I, this is a free, free accident. Why would you pick up a grenade and then drop it? Bring it in it's to an club. But all these stupid things guys were doing, things that guys would come in with trauma created by prostitutes that they used to do these guys. I mean, really bad stuff. I mean, stick a pen down, all the way down into there. You know, they, they, in Vietnam, you could go to any pharmacy and get any pill for anything. And one would just knock you out and they stick a pen all the way down the penis and mm -hmm. leave it. The guy would wake up screaming and it's just horrible stuff. I mean, they were, you had to be very careful. Mm -hmm. And you know, being careful is you lose some money and you lose some jewelry, big deal. At least they always did that. But the other thing over there, very interesting, was the racial issue. It became very intense. And about in 69 it started to get real intense and black mm -hmm. power and I remember going to the mess hall, the black guys would always separate themselves and they could never sit down to eat until they did the dap bump 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 bump. Every, every yeah. week the dap changed, you know. Yeah. Well, and uh, they became very, I don't know, angry. They were learning their history, I guess, and they had black bars you couldn't go into and I had a black friend who went in there and I almost got the shit beat out of me because I was with him and they didn't want any white guys in there and blah 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 and it was all it was very racial especially not in the part of the infantry units but more in the support units and there was some fights and all those kinds of things but that was another issue we had to deal with we kind of stayed away from that mm -hmm. the guys who were friends were friends so but it was an interesting experience and I appreciate the opportunity well thank you. thank you for your interview okay great